the end of it, I think I was just creatively done. I'm a lazy gear, I just go out and do it, you know, and play the drums. I tried to do something about it, but after that I kind of withdrew into myself. Bruce was ready for the funny farm, pretty much. It definitely felt like, OK, you know, we've come back and we've piped the flag in the British soil. I mean, World Slavery Tour, yeah, we were all um, fit as trouts at the end of that, you know, running around, skinny as rakes, and all a bit, well, I think all going a bit barking mad. I mean, I was certainly, I was definitely going stir-crazy. I thought, you know, 13 months on the road was not conducive to the uh, state of my mental health. Basically, you know, 13 months on the road, you know, fried everybody, and some people more than others, and Bruce was really, you know, fried. Obviously, you know, it's a, it's a tougher gig for him, you know, trying to sing up in that register for two hours every night, you know, five, six nights a week, and it's tough, so... He was ready to, for the funny farm, pretty much. So, you know, I went through a bit of a period when I, I sort of considered jacking the whole thing in, actually. Five years on the road is, let's say, a year can be like five. The end of it, I think I was just creatively done. Uh, exhausted. I mean, it's like, like nothing, nothing left in the tank, really. That's the beauty of having, you know, strong writers in the band. That if one's drying up or one's, you know, messed up or wet for whatever reason, you know, you've got other people who can come in and take over, and uh, you know, it wasn't a problem really. At that point, I think we'd done. Let me see, since I was a man, Killers, uh, Peace of Mind, Power Slave, and then. You know, had a break and it was a bit of a taking stock time. I think Bruce might have wanted to go back to a sort of a more of an acoustic -y approach. Most of the things that I had were really trying to completely turn Maiden, uh, you know, upside down and on its head. You know, I said, you know, sh haven't we done this big metal thing? You know, should we go a bit more chill out? You know, maybe we should go a bit more acoustic -y. Maybe we should do a, a you know. Um, and everybody looked like looked at me like I had two heads. I just said, look, you know, a lot of these songs, are, you know, there's some good ideas, but they're just not really right for us. It's kind of very Jeffro Tully kind of stuff, which I love, but it just wasn't really right. I don't know, it didn't feel right at that time. Basically, there's like a level of writing that had to be achieved. And so probably my confidence wasn't as, you know, on that level. But a couple of things I pulled in I enjoyed. I'm a lazy gear. I just go out and do it, you know, and play the drums. I'd never really any kind of big ambitions to be a songwriter. It's such a grey area right in. I mean, who's to say and who's not to say? It's just, a, you know, you can argue it's a matter of opinion, but, you know, at the end of the day, you've just got to trust your judgment and your gut feeling, and I, I always go by that. So, um, lucky enough, again, everybody's kind of always trusted me on that, really. Adrian's never really been one for writing too many lyrics, so um, the fact that he came in and wrote some lyrics himself, you know, I think he just wanted to experiment himself with some stuff. It worked out great, you know, three really superb songs. I've been recording on this little four track, which uh, T act, I mean, it was about that big, you know, I'm sat in my room in Jersey. We used to lock ourselves away in Jersey in January. It was really, actually looking back, it was really grim. It used to pour rain, it was freezing cold. We had this hotel on the edge of a cliff, you know sat there looking out the window, looking at the rain, you know. But I got that guitar in, I sort of plugged it in and it started making all these wacky noises, of like a sequence. And he was playing me some bits and pieces and I was like, mm, yeah, it's OK, but... And then at the end of the tape, it kind of ran on and I went, oh, what's that? And it was the intro to Wasted Years. I went, bloody hell, that's great, that's right, you know. He went, oh, I thought that'd be too commercial. I went, what? I said, I don't give a shit about that. I thought it was just a really, really good song and so we ended up doing it. <laughs> nurse! <laughs> I remember that particular album, I think we allowed ourselves six weeks, but we ended up writing most of it in the last two, because the first four weeks, were, I think we were in Jersey or wherever, and we were all on, on the lag, so we didn't really get a lot done. And then we thought, hold on a minute, you know, we're running out of time here, we better, um, we better get something done. 
And it's amazing what you can come up with when you're under pressure. We had recharged and it was like next chapter, turning, you know, turning the page over and getting on with it. And uh, we went back to NASA and did the basic, uh, the rhythm tracks there. Camp's Point was fantastic. I mean, you know, it was like, are we uh, on holiday? Are we working? Oh, yes, we'd, you know, so we'd get up. It was a kind of start early afternoon. You get up in the morning, go for a swim, lay by the pool, and we'd gradually ease into the day. But I think we recorded half of the album was recorded there. We'd done the rhythm tracks there. But, the, you know, there was a bit of a bone of contention about guitar sounds and whatnot, so we shifted it over to, to Europe, Whistle Lord Studios, to finish it out. We basically did the rhythm tracks there. So we lived in Amsterdam for six weeks, which is kind of quite an exciting place to live. <laughs> The studio was actually quite a way out of Amsterdam, but no, and it was in the middle of nowhere, you know, windmills, dikes, uh, a lot, you know, and no one wanted to stay out in the studio, so we had to commute uh, back and forth. But it was a great studio. Everybody had collective guitar synthesizer madness because the first guitar synth had come out, you know. The early ones were very volatile. I mean, you never quite know. I mean, when I bring it in and start playing it, it can make some really quite funny sounds, you know, and you, you could sort of leave yourself exposed to uh, ridicule. We did say that we wanted to use some guitar synths. That was the only thing that we consciously thought we wanted to use. I mean, like any album we write, there's no conscious effort to be this or that or whatever. I mean, it's just a natural process. It always is, and it's a spontaneous process. Any great constructed piece of work that's original People always try and pick in and go, oh, that's a bit different, that's a bit of a departure. It's not really the old gallopy maiden, you know, and the Iron Maidens and the number of the beasts and the troopers and stuff like that, you know. And people would start to go, oh, hang on, it's a bit different. It's a bit commercial, isn't it? You know, is it? And it's not something we sit and analyse. It's only, we only analyse it like months and months later when you go and do all the press and then everyone's asking you questions about hey, what you thought about this time and were you in the bath when you wrote this and blah, blah, blah. And, and then you start thinking, well, you know, I didn't really think about that at all, really. You just, that, we just get on and do it, you know. It's just the way things come out and that's the way I made them always, always have been. As far as I'm concerned, I'm, I, I am not about the music. I mean, I love the music, I love what they do, I'm a fan. Whatever they give me, I think it's the best thing made anyway. So, you know, any of the changes we had in main lineups, the, any changes in the approach to the music, never worried me a bit. I was still focused on where we're going to go because, you know, I've got a lot of faith, basically, in the, in the band's talent. Because I'd, I'd written quite a bit of stuff on Summer in Time, I actually went to the mix in uh, New York, which I didn't, never really used to do. Stuff like the guitar sound was a bit more lush sounding with the amps we were using, and also the snare drum. Whereas Nick tunes his snare very high, we were trying to get it more round sounding and uh, maybe a little bit of reverb on it, you know. So we fattened that up a bit. We had the keyboards, we had the, had the guitars, had a bit more effects going on, so it wasn't so dry. I remember we went back to some flash hotel in, uh, in Manhattan. It was me and uh, Martin Birch, but we'd taken a mix back to the hotel to listen to it. I had a little ghetto blaster in the room, so we had a couple of drinks, and I'd said to the guys in the bar uh, that Tom Jones, the famous Welsh singer, was, uh, was lurking about in the bar. So they didn't believe me. They said, I wouldn't be in there, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so we went upstairs, and we put the, uh, put the stuff on, we listened to it, and there's a knock on the door. I opened the door and there's, and there's Tom Jones standing there. And he had a bottle of champagne, cigar, he had the old bow tie a bit loosened, you know. And he said, oh, I'd say, he said, I heard the music, mind if I come in for a listen to that? Well, that's my Welsh accent, by the way. And uh, so I said, yeah, come in, mate. <laughs> Have a seat. So uh, he really liked what he heard, you know. He said, oh, that sounds really good. Tom's sitting there, pouring champagne, smoking. He stayed there till about four o'clock in the morning. Uh, 
Uh, we've always tried to make that every album is sort of its own little world, that everything's related, you know, the, the fonts we use, the colours, everything about it. You can sort of look at any, any related artwork to any album and know it's from that period. Somewhere in time, Derek came up with a spectacular sleeve with obviously the, the Cyborg Eddie. Uh, which was magnificent. It was great, and I, I, that's still one of my favourite artworks. In fact, it's still one of my favourite walk-on eddies too. We spent days thinking about all the little pubs and clubs and things, and you know, West Ham Seven, Arsenal Three. I wonder who thought of that? And uh, you know, Hammer Jacks and Aces Eye Clubs, and a lot of reference to Bradbury and the books and the literature. And I think, I mean, I, I used to love going to Amsley's where you could watch them, look at them for hours, and see new things. And I think that was the case with that. I think it was just real classic art with so much detail. It's become, I mean, if you go on Wikipedia, there's a whole cult following of that album sleeve on the music and what, what the little bits mean, you know? So we we're very pleased with it. Somewhere in Time came off the back of for the Power Slave Tour, which obviously in Live After Death was very uh, picked on by you by Bruce in particular, as being long. I mean, 192 dates is a long tour. I mean, part of that was, you know, we managed to rise with albums and tours, and every album tour we get a little bit bigger, and which is my job, to make us as big as we can ever in the world. And I thought that on that one, going around America twice would actually double it. And um, didn't really work that way, so then going around twice was probably, in retrospect, not the best idea I ever had. So this one was only 157 shows. <laughs> In the UK, on Somewhere in Town, we had 24 UK shows because Steve never, never really wanted to play arenas in the UK. I mean, we'd be playing arenas in America in 84 very successfully. We toured Europe with Kissing Arenas even way back in 1980, so it's not as we were strangers to arenas or couldn't put on arena shows, uh, just Steve wanted to keep close to fans in the UK. It was a band choice. It wasn't just me. It was just a conscious decision that we felt that we wanted to do that. You know, I suppose prove a point that we could do that many shows. This was the great inflatable tour. At the time, Dave Lights was still doing our lighting stuff, and he was well into inflatables. And he had a bit of uh, inflatable megalomania, in fact. He built inflatables that were so big they wouldn't actually fit inside the sodding buildings. We had these massive spaceships, because the whole thing was inspired by Blade Runner. So he tried to recreate Blade Runner uh, in some way uh, on the stage. So we had two big hydraulic hands, which would raise up, not spinal tap at all, with, with big eddy claw hands that would inflate like that. Me and Bruce stood in the palms of the inflatable hands. So I'd be on, like if I'm looking out of the audience, I'd be on the left side, Bruce would be on and the one on the right side. One particular night, a lamp was too close, to, and as it was inflatable, it burnt hole in it, so consequently it was like, you know, so I was feel all right plunk us being up there like that. But not only that, the best thing about it, the next gig we did, they patched it up. So it came up like that, but they came, it came tied up. <laughs> they tied the fingers back, so it came up with a middle finger, uh, so it was quite hilarious. Like that. You know, and, and all of a sudden there'd be roadies frantically coming out and going, pff, pff, pff. they're sort of like they're sort of like um, an alien hand fluffers. And so cool, so I'm up there again, thinking, mm, I bet I look really cool up here now with that guy. <laughs> it was uh, really funny. It was good, priceless moment. We had the rising drum kit, so that came up on hy hydraulic jacks, taking Nico to stratospheric heights. Uh, and of course, the eddy head that inflated underneath it was great, except when the, the pressure started to go and it looked like a bit like a saggy bin liner. And so, you know, again, they'd be waiting for the thing to come up, you know, and Steve would always be turning around, you know, giving that sort of daggers, sort of like, fucking hell, now, what's going on? Who's in charge? You know, uh, someone will pay for this, you know. All right. <laughs> one after one. The start of the quick side. Steve was really fed up with me that we never did a, a, a concert film of Somewhere in Time. At the time, I thought it was a bit too soon after Live After Death, 
And in retrospect, it was a great show. And we have got bits of it, but we haven't got a full record of it. I really wanted to film that tour, and Rod went, we're not bloody filming this tour for whatever reason. I can't remember the reason now. Probably money, but or whatever, I don't know. But And we've regretted it ever since. And the night, fires are burning bright. Ritual has begun. I decided to go, you know, sci-fi spinal tap. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, uh, uh, I didn't think it was spinal tap at the, t at the time, but you know, I mean, it's a pretty odd garment that I'm wearing out there, you know. Right, see, what I want to do is I sort of want the top half to be a bit Errol Flynn. You see, the bottom half, I want to make it look like um, their trousers uh, that would be worn by some sort of, like, uh, spaceman sort of uh, space hunter in the Forbidden Zone type guy who's come along, uh, come along and he's shot lots of, like, alien-looking toads and made trousers out of them. How do we keep them up? OK, so we've got to go with the Andy Pandy little shoulder straps and things like that. And then we had the issue of the very kitsch style beating heart with uh, what was supposed to be rope lights, which of course now you can get really, really cool little lights. The idea was that the whole suit would be covered in like veins that would just be pulsing the whole time. So in the end, the way they got it to work was about 30 pounds of copper wire inside a big jacket and a six volt lead acid battery from Hugo stuck in there, which ran out of juice after about, oh, about halfway through the song. So the heart was sort of go, doom, 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 like that. It was a talking point. But it was eccentric, you know, when you look back. He was actually looking for something a little bit different. And at first when we saw it, we thought, mm, I'm not sure about that. But he wore it well. You know, what can I say? I wouldn't be able to get away wearing something like that. He did. I don't know what we were thinking. I, t <laughs> um, I think, you know, that was the era, the period where I basically was big, loud costumes and then loud productions, a loud band. Everything was really loud about everything. You had to wear sunglasses quite a lot <laughs> because it just was the sheer uh, volume. Actually, there was a lot of volume coming just from the clothing. But in those days, I mean, yeah, I mean, I suppose there's a few fashion faux pas, but I'll have you know, it's, I mean, my kids have taken a mick out of me for that over the years, but when they look back at stuff, Dad, how could you wear that? But I said, yeah, you know what? We were pathfinders. A lot of people used to copy us, actually, and, and all that. You wouldn't believe it, would you, really, some of the stuff we used to wear, but there you go. What can I say? I think we all look, you know, a bit different in those days. It's a big deal to play the Budokan. It was the first time we played it, and Budokan is a hugely famous Japanese martial arts centre. I found the Budokan strangely uh, uh, disappointing, actually. I'd always visualised it as being the Budokan, and it's just a gym. You know, it's sort of an honour to play there, and it's really nice in Japan to reach the, the stage where you can. Yeah, I took all my fencing kit with me, and uh, I thought, oh, great, I'll just, just be the singer, so I can just go off and do lots of fencing. You don't have to worry about anything else, you know? Not my words, not my songs. Hey, you know. I did some training with the, the Japanese team when, when I was when I was out there, and a few other bits and bobs. I was getting quite seriously, was getting quite seriously into it at that point. got to the end of that tour and I thought, no, that wasn't too bad. Hmm. You know, have a little think about things. And then chatting to Steve and he said, concept album, Seven Sun, you know, and, uh, and that, that, that was it. I was, I was off to the races then. I was like, brilliant.
basically the idea of writing the song, uh, The Clairvoyant, and it, that was because the Clairvoyant at the time, Doris Stokes, died, and just had the thought, thought, well, I wonder if she could foresee her own death. Who knows? But um, so I just started off with that sort of idea, and then so I wrote The Clairvoyant, and then went to Bruce with it, and basically he said, oh, you know, it's a great idea. I started having an idea for um, uh, the song Seventh Son of the Seventh Son because supposedly if you were born the seventh son and the seventh son you had the powers of clairvoyance so I had those two ideas and Bruce went you know what we should do a, you know a concept album about this. I, I considered whether or not we would actually you know I could actually write something and have it as you know part of the album actually come up with a sort of a bit, a bit of a fairy tale um, about the whole thing uh, and, and have it follow a structure like most things it got about halfway down the track and then sort of veered off at a tangent, you know, because whenever we've done concept albums in Maiden, we've never followed the plot slavishly. We've gotten about halfway through and then done a song about the Battersea Dogs home in the middle of it or something. You think, why is that on there? He goes, oh, just because it is. OK, Harry went, we're going to make a concept album about Seven Son of the Seventh Son, premonitions and that kind of vibe. And that is how that came about. So the album was actually written with it. All the guys are writing within the concept of that framework, if you like. It's the only time we've ever written an album with an, a concept in mind. Every song's got to stand up on its own. You say you don't want it to get too airy-fairy. And, it, you know, I think it pretty much does. You know, you have the, the, the intro, the Seven Deadly Sins. Seven deadly sins, seven ways to win. Seven holy paths to hell and your trip begins. Which probably is stuff Bruce had left over from when he was doing his acoustic things, you know. And then we, you know, we had the sort of epic intro Moonchild thing. As again, me messing about with a, just a delay, really, a guitar, which we ended up doing on our keyboard as well. And we had, it took ages to do that because I had a demo with a certain timing on it, which is not what ended up on the record, but I just couldn't um, convey it to, to the other chaps. And, and it got to the point where it was like, say, oh, you know, let's get this done, you know. So it wasn't 100% what I sort of envisaged, but um, yeah, it started pretty good anyway. It was another step on from somewhere in time. We decided we wanted, you know, beforehand, that we wanted to carry on with those experiments with big, grandiose kind of sounds. Um, but it was, it had to be keyboards. Munich was, you know, we talked about it because we knew it was a good, good studio. Um, I think Martin Birch had done an album there before and said it was good. And we just felt like going somewhere different, really. Um, so, Munich it was. This was just oozing, you know, you think these albums, my favourite albums, have been recorded here. So when we done Seventh Son, it was at the bottom of the Alabella Hotel in Munich. So we would you'd get up in the morning and get in the elevator and go down to the bottom and go to the studio. In November 587, we finished Somewhere in Time tour, April 27. 1988 started the next tour, so you're looking at November 5 to April 28 to completely write, record, mix, and release some sun, but it was always how it was. Infinite dreams, I can't deny them. Infinity. It's nicely somewhere in time, actually, as a transitional album. Not quite fully formed. If it was a claymation figure, it, it wouldn't quite be painted yet. It wouldn't. It would have. It would have the eyes, the arms, and bits and bobs. And you'd say, "Well, yeah, that's a, yeah, I, I see what you, where you get, where you go in there, you know." But when you go with Seven Sun, it's a much more recognisable, definitive, you know, statement. Right, boom. Here's the whole thing, all, all in one piece. Mucking about with synths and things like that on Somewhere in Time enabled everybody to go the extra little nudge and go, yeah, OK, we can do something like Seventh Son now. We'd all uh, accepted the idea of uh, keyboards as part of the part of the sort of palette of colours that we could use uh, in Maiden. It was no longer a 
forbidden term, a la in the Polish wed wedding. Uh, you can't play heavy metal with synthesizers. You, know, you can't play heavy metal with synthesizers, you know. It's actually true, you, not the sort of style stuff that we were doing back then. Uh, but as Maiden turned slowly from being a razor-edged, punky metal type thing uh, into a, a prog metal band, effectively, or a band with, certainly with sort of proggy aspirations. It's all challenging, but we, if you do your homework and practice enough and not go gallivanting off down the pub, you should be, you should, you should be okay. Well, as you say, Seventh Son itself, that particular track, has quite a long song, epic classical maiden song there. So that was a bit of a challenge because of the different elements in there. And also, you know, there's that feel and emotion. You know, there's all sorts of things going on in there. So you have to think about that, yeah. For the launch of uh, Seven Sun, we rented, or Ema rented, a, a really nice castle of Schloss on the Rhine in Germany. Oh, we had all the media from Europe and America came in for a long weekend of uh, interviews, drinks, uh, playbacks, drinks, and photos and drinks. And uh, we've never been a corporate band. We steer well away from corporates and sponsorship and we don't do what some do. And we try to keep the, all the corporate logos away from the stage as much as we can. We don't want our name tied to corporate products. And uh, at that time, Puma came along and said, would you like some free kit? So of course, yes, of course we do. But Puma's a great deal because the band insists on wearing the bloody tracksuits all the time. So the photos from that time look appalling. You know, they're there almost in shell suits. I mean, really, not very metal. That was about as far as we got into any sponsorship. And it, from my viewpoint, it was a complete disaster. Can I play with madness? Yeah, Graham Chapman, yeah, well, you know, uh, Monty Python, you know, bless him. I mean, I, I, I didn't actually meet Graham. I think it was the only guy in the band that didn't. He was going to come down to Atlanta, but bless him, he knew he was quite ill already with uh, throat cancer. But so, you know, he did the video, obviously, and, you know, he was, he was, quite, he was quite thin and, and, and gaunt on the video. Um, but, you know, being a doctor, he, you know, he knew the implications of what was, what was kicking off. So, I mean, I thought he was terribly, terribly brave to do it. And he was excellent in it as well. I still think it's a really strong album. I, I really do. And, um... You know, in some areas of the world we got fantastic reviews, other places we didn't. I mean, it hit number one in the UK and it was a, almost like it was more a European album. It wasn't as received as well over in the States. But you know what, I couldn't care less because at the end of the day it was like, you know, if people like it, they like it, if they don't, they don't. And we thought it was a really strong album. We, f we still think it's a really strong album. I think it stood the test of time and I think if we were to do any of those songs off that album uh, live, I think they would still stand up against anything that we've done uh, before or afterwards. So. Yeah, I think it's a strong album. Monsters of Rock Donis was a big thing for us. We were offered every year to, um, to play on it. I don't know why, but I just didn't really want to do it. Because again, festivals were failing. You know, the Reading be going for a long time. I just wanted to wait to a headline day for some reason. I, don't, I couldn't explain why. It just seemed the right thing to do. Feel the sweat break on my We sold 66,000 tickets in advance. 
and we only expected to do a walk up of maybe you know five ten thousand at the most and then like we had 41,000 walk up it was, it was amazing they run out of tickets Morris was giving uh, raffle tickets out to be able to get in Morris Jones up for murder it was immense I mean, it was a new height for the band. And we came off afterwards thinking, wow, what a fantastic, amazing gig, and all, you know, you know, wound up and happy and everything like that. Of course, the, the, the downside of, like, the glory of um, that day was the fact that, um, a couple of kids died earlier in the day. They were crushed when there was coming down a, a slope. They told us that afterwards, and of course it was just, a, it, it was awful. So, it, you know, from being totally elated to totally down, you know, it was just terrible. Birmingham was the Midlands, was pretty rowdy. We're doing two nights with the NEC. Coming back to the England and playing that sort of uh, concert tour in these huge arenas, and so that we you know the Birmingham where we recorded those um, shows. It definitely felt like, okay, you know, we've come back and we've planted the flag in the British soil. There was a lot that went on in that time. We did a lot of touring. It, it wasn't like it happened overnight, so, you know, we didn't just go from that to, you know, playing big arenas and all that. We sort of did a, a lot of our draft around the world and touring and everywhere and supporting and doing all kinds of stuff before we sort of actually hit that point. I think we sort of almost crammed 15 years of a for touring into eight years. I think looking at uh, the Made in England video, it's very different to Live After Death. Because Live After Death, I worked with the director Jim Yukich and more or less supervised it. You know, we had the, we changed the, the Star Spangled Banner at the back of the hall in Long Beach and put a Union Jack there. So the first shot, which to me was the perfect shot, was panning over this huge audience. Because being the manager, I want to get out there, hey, my boys are big, you know? So it just, there's a lot of great audience stuff in there. Well lit, massive hall, everything else. Second one we came to Made in England, Steve said, well, you sort of did that one. It's my turn now. And uh, so, but he wanted to do it in a totally different way, which is the fan point of view. I wanted to film it as if it was through 10 or 12, you know, fans' eyes. So if you gave a fan a can crawl dump, you know, because a lot of the footage you see from fans or whatever, I mean, it's just captures the moment. It might not technically be brilliant, but it captures the moment because they know what they want to see and they know what to see at what, at what you know, is given time and stuff. So I thought that's the way I wanted it to look. So you look at Maine, England, you wouldn't know you're in an arena. I mean, there's no audience lights, there's no rule, there's some front crowd shots, but not the big hall shots. But Steve, what Steve wanted was to show it as the fans saw it. So not interrupted by the manager going, hey, look at us, we've done four nights at Long Beach, you know. <laughs> I ended up basically directing it myself and editing myself. It was great to see Bruce again carrying Dave and his shoulders around. I don't think you do that now. Bruce, um, unexpectedly actually, never told me about it. We were just playing on stage. The next minute he came on um, and lifted me up and then off we went flying around the stage. So I was like hanging on the guitar trying to play and then trying to hold on with our legs for dear life. We kind of got into a thing where we'd done that for a couple of years. This can't go It was fun, you know, after we got over the, after the first vertigo kind of shock, 
and hurt him around the stage. You know, <laughs> it was um, it was it was fun. It was a ride. He comes up on the drum riser and I can see his legs and between my drums and my cymbal, because my, my big cymbal, you know, there's not a lot of, you know, so I can see him. I can't actually see him. I just see his legs through the drum, right? So I think, oh, he's going to, and I go and hit the cymbals on the right and he's there and he, all of a sudden he's out and goes, and he, then the next thing he'll walk up and he's, he's got his arms on all three of them. So I, I can't win. I was bored. <laughs> What's interesting as well, the barrier is so tiny. I mean, health and safety now, we've got a perpetual fight on barriers because almost some of the, um, the halls or the facilities, they want the barrier so far away, you, you can hardly shout at the kids, you know, and the maid light them right up. So in those days, you had the crowd right in front of you, so you know, a matter of feet from the stage. And you can really see that in that video, the interaction. Uh, Bruce could actually reach out and touch the hands of the front rows, which nowadays you needed two, two broom handles to do that. Hey, it's the first time we ever played the NEC. You probably know what that was, what we do? Got a whole disguise up on stage now. I think Bruce relationship with the audience has always been completely natural. Um, he doesn't talk at them, he doesn't talk above them, he doesn't shout at them. One of the appeals of Maiden is they are so genuine and natural and um, it's something in some ways I've always been careful to portray. I've got a scarf from a funny place called Wales. When I first saw the, the video, I thought it was stunning. The, you know, the production of it, the sound of it, the way we were playing, which was immense. I mean, we were, we were playing so fast and it was kind of retro made. It was what we were doing in the 80s. It was, you now when I look back at it and I see it, that, you know, I, I see the Made in England and uh, I'm like, wow, that is really fast. Seven Son of the Seven Son. Blimey, Bruce can't even sing it. It was so quick. <laughs> But uh, it, it worked for us at that time. On the night, we just we did what we did. The audience was great. And looking back on it, it did bring back a lot of memories because. Uh, we used to play the songs too fast, and I'm sure a lot of people would notice this. I don't know if the real hardcore fans would notice it, because when you come off stage and the audience has gone mad, but you're not feeling satisfied, it started to get a bit of a thing in mind, and I, I keep mentioning it, I felt like I was being a drag, but because the audience was loving it, and people were going, ah, oh, no, don't matter about it. There was a great energy coming off of them. When that, and when you get that positive energy coming in from the audience, you know, it goes back out. So that's the thing with this audience, what I made in audiences, they're like that all over the world. I just couldn't believe the speed that these songs were played at. And it, it's really a shame because we were kind of like some really interesting songs at the time, but we were just kind of choking the life out and just playing them too fast. I spoke with Adrian about it the other day and he, he, he wasn't happy, but he wasn't happy when we made it. I tried to do something about it, but after that I kind of withdrew into myself and I just became a little bit down about the whole thing. And, um, you know, a year later I wasn't in the band.